Alrighty, um, let's get going today. So good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on disease control and fungicide resistance management in Victoria, brought to you by the Australian Fungicide Resistance Extension Network, or APRIN for short. Uh, my name is Kylie Island and I'm the Extension Coordinator for APRIN um, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. So before we get started, just some brief housekeeping, if I can have the next slide, Grant. So basically everyone should be muted already. I'm sure we've zoomed around the place a lot by now. Um, to ask a question though, please use the Q&A function, which you can see at the bottom, usually by scrolling your cursor over the bottom of your screen. Um, and that'll be how we'll answer questions. Um, and we will answer questions all at the end of the, the webinar. So don't feel like you're not being heard where we just run the whole webinar and then do it then. Um, in the unlikely, very unlikely event of a webinar hacking, we'll send you a new link um, within a few minutes of that. And uh, please be kind. Next slide, Grant. Um, so just basically that's to, just as a reminder for what that Q&A looks like in case you're having trouble finding it on your own screen. Um, and we will get to those, as I said, at the end of the webinar and next slide. So just for some background, AFRIM was basically born, is a, it's a GRDC initiative and it's born out of the recognition that fungicide resistance is a serious and increasingly prevalent problem in Australian grains. Um, so our remit is to deliver regionally specific resources and training to help growers and advisors understand the status, risks and management of fungicide resistance in Australia. And to do this, we're developing and delivering a fungicide resistance management guide, workshops, info sessions and webinars such as today and fact sheets, updates and email alerts. And we're able to do this by harnessing the skills and expertise of plant pathologists, fungicide resistance experts and comms and extension specialists across the country. And that regional aspect and why we're having a Victorian webinar today is really important because the risks change wherever you are in the country country. So you'll see um, some maps today, which will show you how that's different. Um, on the call today with us though, from that AFRIN team, we have Lauren and Bridget who are in the background um, from Ag Communicators, helping us with technical and comms support. Uh, a little bit later, we'll, we should have Fran Lopez Ruiz from the Centre for Crop and Disease Management at Curtin University come in and he's our resident expert in fungicide resistance, diagnostics and management. Um, but the star of the show today is um, Grant Holloway from Agriculture Victoria. And Grant, I'm sure is familiar to many of you. Um, he's a senior plant pathologist with Agriculture Victoria. He's based at Horsham, um, where he's been for the last 28 years. And he's done a lot of research and extension toward industry into the management and disease um, of diseases of field crops. And Grant plays an instrumental role in the assignment of the independent wheat disease ratings to new cereal cultivars as part of the NVT disease rating processes. Um, so it's with great pleasure that I now pass to Grant to enlighten us on um, disease risk, uh, or sorry, disease control and fungicide resistance management in Victoria uh, with a focus on the medium rainfall zone. So off we go, Grant. Yeah, good afternoon everybody and thank you Kylie for the introduction. So today we're going to talk about uh, fungicide resistance in cereals and strategies that we can use to protect our limited range of uh, fungicide actives. And fungicide resistance is one of the things I see as a, one of the major threats that we're going to see in cereal production in coming years. So it's something that we, we need to start acting on now uh, to try and minimise the impact of fungicide resistance on our production systems into the future. Yeah, given the interest in disease issues that are out there in the field at the moment, I'm going to be very happy to hang around after the um, main part of the seminar finishes and take any questions that you may have at the, at the end. As Kylie said, questions will be at the end. Um, not just about fungicide resistance, but any uh, issues that you've got at the moment, because I know I'm getting a lot of questions about uh, septoria and uh, strike brush, just to name a few at the moment, given the recent rain events that we've had across this part of Victoria. So I'm going to kick off by starting to give a short history of foliar fungicide use in cereals in Victoria. And it is 
really a short history because in the scheme of agriculture, it's a, been a relatively short time that we have been using uh, foliar fungicides. So 1980s, there was a limited range of uh, fungicides available. Uh, they, were, they were expensive and compared to what we're using today, they were not overly eff effective. So a major part of the disease management uh, for foliar diseases on farm was through the growing of varieties with adequate levels of resistance. And our breeding programs had minimum standards, so they wouldn't release varieties that couldn't stand up on their own. So they had to have a level of genetic resistance in there to protect them from disease so that they could still yield in the presence of disease. But clearly, you know, diseases were playing a significant part because we didn't have the range of fungicides available. In the 1990s, late 1990s is when we started to see some routine use of foliar fungicides for disease control in wheat. And that was particularly with the use of tridimophon uh, for leaf rust control in the high rainfall area. That's where they were growing a couple of varieties that were highly susceptible to leaf rust. And this uh, fungicide uh, was providing a cheap option for that. But where the big change happened in terms of adoption of foliar fungicides for disease control in cereals was following the strike rust epidemic in 2003. That's when we had a new strain of strike rust arrive in Eastern Australia, was what was known at the time as the Western Australian strain. So effectively a new introduction of strike rust to into Australia that rendered many of our cultivars with inadequate resistance. So they needed some additional protection. And at that time, we were seeing an increasing range of fungicides available and also some cost effective and more effective fungicides becoming available. So the use of fungicides as part of the control strategy of diseases on farm was becoming quite viable. And this also lined up with, you know, compared to where we were 20 years before, the ability of farmers to apply chemicals over large areas with uh, the equipment that they had to do that as well. So during the 2000s, we were seeing an increasing range of triazoles available and we saw strobibulins come to the market as well in Australia. So the last decade, we, the range of actives continued to expand with SDHIs uh, as a new group becoming available, and particularly as a seed treatment with uh, Sestiva being released to the market. An increasing range of actives becoming available and mixtures of actives and groups. Now with this range of cheap and highly effective fungicides, we have become highly reliant on them for disease control. This has enabled decreased reliance on both genetic resistance and cultural control. We have a system where fungicides in many cases are doing most of the work. And when we're reliant totally on fungicides, we're now in a situation where the honeymoon is over. After 20 years, by making fungicides doing more and more of our disease control work, we're seeing increased reports of fungicide resistance. And I want you to ask the question, ask yourselves the question, can you grow fungicides with, uh, can you grow cereals without fungicides? Because if we continue to use them extensively till we break them, we're going to lose them. So there's a lot of practices where we're using fungicides as a cheap and effective option. But if we continue to make fungicides do all the work, we're going to increasingly see fungicide resistance and we are going to have less options for controlling disease with fungicides. So in the last 10 years, we've had gone from a situation where we had no fungicide resistance reports in Australia to now reports across a range of diseases to a range of groups of fungicides right across Australia. And you see the ones highlighted in the red boxes are the issues uh, that we're seeing in Victoria. So quite a number of reports of uh, fungicide resistance out there commercially. The fungicides that we use in cereals can be divided into resistance groups based on their activity similar to the grouping we see with herbicides. So 
So three groups represent the majority of fungicides that we use in cereals. And for a full list of the groups, the fungicide groups that are available, uh, I recommend that you have a look at the Crop Life website at the top of the page there. And that's where there's the full list of um, fungicide groups. But the most of our cereal fungicides fit into three groups. Group seven is the SDHIs, most commonly known for fluxoperoxide or Sestiva and the Evergold Prime as seed treatments. The majority of our fungicides sit in the triazole group with a whole range of actives there, the ones that you'd be familiar with, with uh, propiconazole, tebuconazole, flutriophol, um, just to name a few. And then the final group is the strobibulins, uh, group 11. So as you can see here, none of the strobes are available as on their own. They're all only available as a mixture. And in most cases, they're a mixture with a group three fungicide. Now, the rationale of that is that strobes are, are highly, highly prone to develop, having fungicide resistance develop in the pathogen populations. So since the industry uh, recognised how vulnerable this group of uh, fungicides are to resistance developing, they are only available in the marketplace mixed with another active or, or a group, another group of chemistry. And the fact that we only have one case of resistance to a group 11 fungicide in cereals uh, in nearly 20 years is a testament to how effective the mixing of groups is in uh, delaying the onset of fungicide resistance. And then in recent times, we've had the release of uh, combinations of group seven and group three uh, fungicides with some recent uh, releases. Currently in the marketplace, we for cereals, we don't have a mix of the three uh, groups there. We may see something in the future, but there's nothing commercial at the moment. In terms of terminology, when we're talking about fungicide resistance, there's three terms that uh, are adopted to talk about the level of resistance in pathogens. And we talk about, the first one is sensitive, and that's where the effectively the fungicide still works. So it's a case where it works effectively, kills the pathogen at the concentrations you'd expect it. Reduced sensitivity is where the, the pathogen is able to uh, still tolerate the presence of the fungicide, but not grow as well as, sorry, but it, it can grow. I better start that bit again. Sorry, the reduced sensitivity is where the pathogen is still able to grow in the presence of the fungicide. So in the sensitive one, uh, fungicide works, pathogen dies. When we talk about reduced sensitivity, at the, the pathogen is still is able to grow but not as well as it would if the fungicide wasn't there. So its growth is, um, is still slowed by the fungicide, but it can still grow. Then we talk about when the pathogen is resistant to the fungicide and it effectively can grow unimpeded in the presence of that fungicide. So what you'd see in, in the field is that it doesn't work. So, you know, and it's something that we don't wanna to continue to use. So that this is where you're seeing field failure, reduced sensitivity, maybe at a lower rate, you may see it not working as well as you expect, but often you may not be noticing that in the field. But to really confirm whether we've got reduced sensitivity or resistance, we need to uh, take it to the laboratory for confirmation. So simply the work in the laboratory uh, can be done through growing the fungus on uh, media that's amended with the fungicide. So in this in a Petri dish, there would be fungicide uh, diluted into that uh, media. And then the fungus or the, the plant pathogen is applied onto that media and then the amount of growth is observed. So in this case where we've got a sensitive pathogen, due to the presence of the pathogen, there's no growth. So that's what we would see in most cases. When we have some reduced sensitivity, we can see there is growth of the pathogen there but it is retarded. So it's still not growing as well as you'd expect, but it is able to grow compared to uh, where it's sensitive. Then when we go to the resistant uh, fungal 
growth there. It grows unimpeded by the, even in the presence of the, of the fungicide. Molecular tests can then be used to confirm what, yeah, the mechanisms behind the resistance there, whether it's gene mutations or overexpression of genes. So that's another tool that can be used to help confirm uh, the presence of fungicide resistance in a pathogen population. Deve development of fungicide resistance, when we go from a sensitive population to a resistant, can vary based on the fungicide group that we're looking at. When we think about uh, the stro strobibulin group or group 11, the, it's a single step. So the pathogen population can go from where it's sensitive, so we get complete control, to where there's no control. So there's no warning steps, it's basically a single step from being sensitive to resistant where the pathogen can grow freely. In contrast, when we talk about group three or the triazoles, it tends to be multi-steps. So we go from uh, where the pathogen is completely sensitive to reduce sensitivity to the fungicide to resistant. And the advantage or something that's good about this process here is that if we can detect it at these early stages, it serves a warning that we are on the road to resistance happening, where when we talk about the group 11s, there's no warning. We go from the chemical working effectively to it not working. So the, the cases of resistance in southeastern Australia that are currently of importance are the uh, Nephorm and Eplotch in barley, powdery mildews in wheat and barley, and Septoria uh, triticide blotch in wheat. I'm going to talk about the example of Nephorm of Nephorm and Septoria triticide, and then we'll move into uh, yeah, what, what we can do to slow the development of fungicide resistance in our pathogen populations. So Nephorm of Nephorm, it's an increasingly important disease in Victoria. For a long time, we haven't had a lot of issues with Nephorm of Nephorm, and that's been because the majority of varieties that we've been growing here have had very good levels of resistance to this disease. We've seen lots of spot form of Nephorm, where we've grown varieties that are susceptible uh, to that disease, but Nephorm of Nephorm, until recently, has been really under control. We're seeing more net form of net blotch now because of uh, the increased use of some susceptible varieties and things like um, Planet is one of those examples. Uh, so we are seeing more net form of net blotch, but it's been a big issue in South Australia for a number of years. And last year, it really came to the fore with the identification of high levels of net form of net blotch in some crops on the York Peninsula where there had been uh, uh, cystiva used and also follow-up uh, foliar applications of triazole fungicides and basically there was observations of field failure. So the team at uh, Curtin University um, with the team at Sadi went out and started to have a look at the situation there. So they undertook surveys right across the York Peninsula as you can see on the map there and collected uh, close to 450 isolates uh, from 15 paddocks to which were then taken back to the laboratory uh, for further analysis. And looking at uh, Cystiva with the active fluxoprioxad, three quarters of the isolates were still sensitive so the, the that fungicide was um, still working uh, in that case. But where there was concern is that in 12% uh, of cases, there was a reduced sensitivity. So against those isolates, the chemical wasn't working as well. And then in 10% of cases, that chemi chemistry wasn't working at all. So for a product that had a yeah, relatively new chemical that's been uh, only on the market for a few years to find that 10% of the isolates in that environment uh, were no longer effective is um, quite a concern that, that we are seeing um, you know, the loss of a very useful chemical 
there. The other part of that story is those isolates were also tested for how they performed in the presence of tebuconazole, so a group three fungicide. Only a quarter of the isolates that were evaluated were fully sensitive to tebuconazole. One third of them had reduced sensitivity, so product wasn't working as well as it should. And then another third uh, were resistant, so they could grow freely in the presence of the concentrations of that fungicide that you would see in the field. One of the questions is, well, how do you, how do we get to this point? And um, one of the things that was happening in, in that environment was a intensive production of susceptible variety. And so in terms of intensive production, there were cases where paddocks had had three out of four years had been a susceptible variety. And if you grow a susceptible variety in such intensity, you've got a production system that is highly reliant on chemicals as the only control strategy. And they were highly reliant on applying the SDHI on seed and a triazole applied um, during the season. So when you have a high reliance on chemistry for control, it's quite likely that you're going to end up in a situation where you have fungicide resistance developing in the pathogen population. A further analysis by the team at Curtin University showed that 20% of the isolates they looked at had reduced sensitivity to both tebuconazole and fluxoprioxade. So if both of these chemicals were applied, um, these isolates would continue to grow their growth would be retarded, but they would still be able to survive. But then 4% of the isolates were resistant to both of those chemicals. And that, that is where there's a real concern that if um, for those 4%, should a paddock with that present, then have those two products applied again, at the end of that, the majority of isolates in that paddock would have a dual resistance. So you start, you very quickly select for that from that low level to a high level. And in that case, when that isolate becomes, or those isolates become dominant in an environment, uh, we have two chemicals that are no longer effective. And as we saw in that table early on, uh, there's not a huge range of um, options that we have for disease control on farm. So when we've lost um, two actives uh, in the one situation, it um, does have some implications for the options that growers have going forward in that environment. So at this stage, we don't have any suggestions that the resistance to the SDHI fungicides is widespread outside of South Australia. There's ongoing monitoring, but this is a warning that it may spread into Victoria or similar mutations can occur here if we're using the uh, same uh, practices have been highly reliant on a narrow group of chemi chemistry for control. But we do have, in terms of net form and net blotch, uh, reduced sensitivity uh, to the triazole fungicides. And that's some recent um, findings that serves as a warning that um, we need to protect our fungicides going forward. If you suspect that you have reduced uh, efficacy of fungicides in the field, get in touch and we can look at um, doing some sampling and follow-up testing to confirm what's going on. The next disease I'd like to talk about is Septoria tritici blotch. Now this has become a widespread disease across um, southeastern Australia, but particularly in our high rainfall areas and also in our medium rainfall areas in Victoria. Key identification there is looking in the lesions and seeing those black dots there. So those fruiting bodies um, make it a quite a diagnostic feature of uh, septoria in the field. Our colleague with the New, universe, uh, with New South Wales uh, DPI at Wagga Wagga, Dr. Andrew Mulgate has been studying fungicide resistance in the septoria population across southeastern Australia for several years. And there's a mutation in the fungicide, in the septoria population called CYP51, or a mutation that we'll refer to now as isoform 11. And that's 
that's the one that has seen um, significant reduce, reduction in sensitivity to some of the triazole fungicides. Fortunately, there's no reports of changes in sensitivity to thrombibulins or the SDHI uh, chemistry at this stage. It is something we need to watch because those chemicals are prone to resistance developing. But again, it comes back to uh, the strobibulins have been used for uh, coming on 20 years in the high rainfall area of Victoria against a pathogen, Benceptoria, that is highly prone to developing resistance to that group of chemistry. But the fact that it's only been used where it's mixed with another group uh, is good evidence that mixing chemicals across groups uh, does protect our fungicides. You know, the experience in Europe is where uh, strobes were used on their own. Septoria developed fungicide resistance exceptionally quickly. So the fact that we've been able to use it against this pathogen uh, yeah, for 20 years is a very good example of how we you know, can employ strategies that protect the longevity of our fungicides. So Andrew's work at monitoring for fungicide resistance has shown wherever those dots are is uh, the, the spread of isoform 11 across southeastern Australia. He, he hypothesises that the that it probably developed it may have developed in um, Tasmania and spread from that environment because Tasmania is where he saw it first and it's at the higher intensity, but then spread across large distances. And what this means in a laboratory situation, which then relates to the field, is when we look at the left-hand side of the graph, this is talking about the concentration of fungicide in the media. So as we move up, more fungicide. And this is the level of fungicide that each of these isoforms, so the different strains of septoria, what concentration of the chemical they can tolerate. So isoform one can only tolerate a very low level of that chemical. Isoform 2 can tolerate more. So it's got um, some reduced sensitivity to the chemical, so it can still grow in the presence of it. Isoform 11, it can tolerate a much higher concentration. So this is the one that's of concern. And this, in this case, this is talking about tebuconazole. So that's starting to get to a point where a low rate of tebuconazole would be having limited effect on uh, this isoform. We compare that with epoxyconazole, so again, concentration of chemical and the different isoforms. If, when we compare the different isoforms, isoform 11 can still tolerate a higher concentration, but much lower than where we're at with the tebuconazole. So this tells us that um, yeah, there's differences between uh, the actives within a chemical group. So that's about how we can rotate actives and also be selecting which actives within a group are still, have a, are st are still effective. He also looked at upfront chemistry, so fluquinconazole, uh, the bar on the left, which is uh, yeah, com more commonly known as uh, jockey versus flutriophile, the fertilizer treatment. And we can see that of the range of isoforms tested, the one that can tolerate the highest concentrations, again, is isoform 11, where in the presence of flutriophile, that isoform can tolerate very high levels, but not the same with the seed applied fluquinconazole. So that tells us that if we're in a situation where um, we're trying to manage our septoria and this uh, resistance strain is present, we're much better uh, looking at using um, the seed treatment as opposed to the fertiliser treatment. And Andrew did some work with growers in Tasmania and uh, could demonstrate quite clearly that where changes were made on farm uh, between those products, they were getting a much better control of that pathogen. And there's a summary of some of Andrew's findings across a range of chemicals ranging from those that the top that are still uh, quite effective uh, down to the bottom um, where not effective at all. I just want to spend a moment talking about the life cycle of 
Septoria because there's some important lessons here in terms of, of the implications for management of fungicide resistance. Now, the first phase of infection for Septoria is the release of spores from stubble, and these spores are airborne and can travel large distances. And it's this large distance dispersal which is particularly important when we talk about fungicide resistance, because what this means is that a bad practice in one area can have influences on you know, right across the whole district. So in contrast to when we talk about uh, resistance in herbicides, the, a lot of, if there's bad practice on one farm where a lot of uh, resistance is developing there, it will have impacts on neighbouring farms, but it, it's less likely to have impacts on a farm that's 500 kilometres away. When we talk about fungicide resistance, this is something that affects the whole industry and it's because of the way that spores can spread large distances uh, on the wind. In terms of septoria, so it's that initial spore release is where we get uh, wind dispersed. The secondary phase of the infection, which happens multiple times during the season, driven by wet conditions, is a rain splash spore. So it's rain splash that moves it up the canopy, reinfects, then with wet conditions that happens over and over. One of the things this tells us though is if we get to the spring, and our crop is quite clean for septoria, it's unlikely to be infected by neighbouring paddocks, which is in contrast to what we're seeing with our strike rust at the moment, that that can be blowing in from crops um, neighbouring or a long way away. But, but once, once your crop's actually up and going, most of the infection is um, going to happen uh, from what's actually in that crop. And the point that uh, Nick Poole, like, Borrow this slide off Nick Pool. Um, he makes at the bottom dry weather. Dry, dry weather is you know, one of our best strategies uh, for this disease because if once we get dry conditions, it stops the life cycle and really stops the disease progressing. One of the things to be aware of with Septoria is that it has a, a long latent period, and the latent period is the the time from when a leaf becomes infected, so a spore germinates on a leaf, to when those symptoms actually appear. And the long latent period does make disease management challenging. Because what that can mean is that, yeah, as particularly at the moment when we've got uh, crops um, during stem elongation, they're rapidly, you know, basically every few days, they're putting another leaf out. But it can take between two to six weeks uh, for the symptoms to show on leaves. So it's very important that we're looking low in the canopy as the point that's made here is um, as those top three leaves emerge, you've got to be looking about two clean leaves below the newest emerging leaf to see where that infection actually is. So don't be deceived by uh, the top two or three leaves looking quite clean. We need to look at what's low in the canopy because that's a, a taste of what will be coming in the future. If the low leaves are clean, then not as much to worry about. So that was just talking about a couple of examples of where we've had fungicide resistance uh, develop in um, southeastern Australia. So now I'm going to, have to go through a few slides just to talk about um, measures to slow resistance to fungicides. I thought probably to start that of what are the strategies we can lose to slow resistance to fungicides. I thought I'd start with well, what would you do if you want to accelerate the resistance to fungicides? And this is an example that um, you know, does have relevance in some areas where growing the same crop or the, that's susceptible to a disease over and over. So in this case, it's a barley on barley, um, stubble retention system, and then having exactly the same fungicide strategy. And when you're growing a susceptible variety and that disease is present, you become highly reliant on fungicides. And then if we apply a narrow range of fungicides, um, which when you don't have resistance present, is a highly effective and cheap way of controlling disease, but it has a limited lifespan. And so you might think, well, this is great, it works, but if you make the fungicides do all the work and um, don't follow any strategies to minimize development, it will happen. 
and then you have to go back to that question I asked at the start, how do you manage your barley situation when you lose some of your very effective and cheap chemicals? So what we're here to talk about is, well, how do we slow or prevent uh, resistance to fungicides developing? The first thing is we reduce our reliance on fungicides. Every time we use a fungicide, we are increasing the probability that resistance is going to happen. It's, it's a numbers game. Every time we use them, we're reducing their, there's, you'll hear talking about in, um, yeah, with resistance in ryegrass, it's about how many shots you get with a new chemical. Every time you use it, you're getting less likelihood that you're, yeah, you're reducing the life expectancy. So we need to think about what can we do to slow resistance developing, first thing is reduce our reliance on the fungicides. The most effective thing we can do is avoid as much as possible growing highly susceptible varieties. This is an example of uh, stripe brush. And these, there's a reason there's a gap in the data here because this is all based on real data. This is um, some studies I did in the field with a large number of varieties and looking at yield loss. So this is yield loss highly susceptible varieties, losing much more yield than our partially resistant varieties and our completely resistant varieties. And one way of thinking about this is in this very susceptible variety, if we're gonna present this, prevent this yield loss, we need a fungicide to do all the work from here to here, it has to do all of it on its own. If we move to an MS variety, the variety is actually doing this part of the work here, so doing more than half of the work, and then the fungicide needs to do the rest. So we're sharing the load around. If we make the fungicides do all the work, we put them under pressure, the chances of resistance uh, developing in the pathogen is much greater. Have a look at uh, the current disease guide. Make sure you've got a current disease guide. Res pathogens do change. And to, so that you can look plan to avoid growing highly susceptible varieties. Similar sort of data with uh, Septoria, we collected at Hamilton last year, highly susceptible variety losing half of its yield, that's Beckham down here, versus a resistant variety uh, losing 16% to yield. So there's, there's a small amount of work here that the fungicide has to do, this is a lot. And in some ways looking at in that Hamilton environment, this has probably needed three fungicides, this probably needed two fungicides, this needed one fungicide. So by choosing a variety with improved resistance, we've reduced the amount of reliance that we have on fungicides in our control program. Again, looking at the disease guide, and if you look at the disease guide for Septoria, uh, you will have a look there and see that there's not a lot of variety options that have adequate levels of resistance. A lot of the varieties that are in the guide are, are susceptible and worse. And where this becomes important is the dialogue that we have with plant breeders. Now for a, in that um, honeymoon period that I mentioned at the start, so when we look back in the 1990s and 2000s, yeah, particularly the 2000s, the message that was getting repeated over and over to breeders was breed for yield, we can manage disease out of can. At five, ten dollars a hectare, we can manage it, give us varieties. And what we saw over time was that that was what the industry was demanding. So we see more susceptible varieties come out. But when you start to look at a scenario of losing um, chemistry, and you think about that net form and net blotch scenario um, where there's isolates out there now that are um, resistant to two chemistry groups. We need to have varieties that have some resistance there. So we need to change the discussion that we have with plant breeders and say, we need to remove those highly susceptible varieties from the system so that we can share the load across varieties. And so the message, we need to avoid sucker varieties. That reduces the amount of pressure that we put on our fungicides. The next is about avoiding high risk situations. So paddock selection. Now again, you think back to where that example I gave at the start a few slides ago. If we put barley on barley and then have a break and put barley again, we are 
planting our crops in a high risk situation, which means we need to do, the fungicides have to do the rest of the work. So we look at this example of increasing levels of inoculum. So this was measured with predictor B, increasing levels of yellow leaf spot inoculum and grain yield. So where we've got high levels of inoculum, yield is around two and a half ton. Low levels of inoculum, yield is um, yeah, close to four. So in this case, we are putting pressure on fungicides to be able to make up this difference, where if we actually put a resistant variety in, we would be up here um, yeah, in terms of yield. So we could do it with a resistant variety, or we could actually put something else in that paddock because we understand the risk. So look at avoiding those high risk situations. Avoiding unnecessary use. So don't use fungicides if we don't need to. So one of the questions to ask yourself before applying a fungicide, is it a disease? Keep in mind fungicides don't fix nutritional deficiencies or physiological issues. Here we've got some examples of herbicide damage, boron toxicity, zinc deficiency, Initial look at these, you go, oh, geez, that's a bad disease. I better put a fungicide out. But in this case, uh, all a fungicide would do is cost you money, cost you time, and not actually fix the problem. Likewise, we have a range of physiological um, traits in plants. Leaf tip necrosis, very common trait in the majority of wheat varieties that we grow. And it's an associated with the adult plant resistance gene in our varieties that causes leaf tipping. Diseases typically don't take the tip out of disease. It's a normal uh, expression because of the strike or the rust adult plant resistance genes in our varieties. Same with the melanization we see in the head and on the stem there, that's uh, associated with the stem rust uh, resistance gene. So not diseases, they don't look good, but these traits have been in these varieties as they've performed well to um, progress through breeding and yield evaluation. Fungicide, um, not, not warranted. There's a whole range of tools out there to help with uh, disease identification. So make sure you've got them as part of your toolbox um, so that we can avoid um, unnecessary fungicide applications. The other thing is, is when disease is there, we do need to ask, just because there's a disease there, does it warrant spray? Will it uh, provide an economic return? Not all diseases cause yield loss. Um, a little bit of disease late in the season, not an issue. Um, there, increasingly, there's decision support tools available and one that uh, was released this year with uh, developed with support of GRDC by uh, the Department of Ag in Western Australia with colleagues around Australia is the Strike Rust Wheat Management app. So it's available for tablets and iPhones by searching the app store for Strike Rust WM. And that helps decide whether a application of fungicides for Strike Rust is actually warranted. Because again, a little bit of disease late in the season in a variety that's got some resistance, um, might be better to save your money and save your time than unnecessarily apply a fungicide. Every time we apply a fungicide, we run the risk of fungicide resistance developing. And in some cases, it may be an off-target um, organism as well. So you may be applying to control rust, um, but that can have an effect on the other pathogens that are present in that crop as well. So it just increases that pressure. So I've talked about you know, ultimately trying to avoid our use and reliance on fungicides, but fungicides are going to continue to be an important part of our disease management strategy. So the next point is, well, when we are using them, what can we do to again, protect those fungicides for the future? So we wanna look, adopt strategies that support longevity. Now I mentioned only spray if necessary, but if we are spraying as much as possible, choose mixtures with different modes of action. Again, I mentioned that example of strobibulins mixed with uh, triazoles has been very effective in Australia for 20 years using a chemical that's highly prone to having um, fungicide resistance develop. So we know that using mixing different modes of action works. Never apply the same group three fungicide twice in a row. So if we are using triazoles and you know, there's a lot of triazoles on the market, try not to use the same active 
over and over. There's, there are benefits in even within the same group of changing to a different active. Now they, the chemi the groups that are more prone to resistance developing are group sevens, which is the SGHIs and groups 11s, the strobes. Don't use them more than once per season and keep in mind what was, a, what was applied uh, at planting as well. So thinking about you know, what was put on um, seed or uh, at planting time, if, if we used a group seven on seed at planting, we don't want to go back with another group seven as a foliar fungicide application. Use fungicides before wide infection. Now I mentioned earlier that uh, fungicide resistance is all about um, numbers as a big driver of it. So we want to have timely application of fungicide. If we wait until an epidemic's out of control, we're then applying that fungicide to a much higher population of um, pathogen. We want to apply low early in the epidemic so they're exposing less of the pathogen there, which reduces the chances of uh, resistance happening. And don't compromise effective control, stay within label rates. And it is, it is paramount that we have strategies that effectively manage disease. And as opposed to being totally reliant on fungicides to do it all, we need to look at the strategies that we can bring together and monitoring and testing as well. So if you suspect that you have fungicide resistance uh, present, uh, get in touch with the team. Just going to um, go through a couple of uh, examples before we head over to questions. Um, this, just looking at, um, you know, if, if this year we grew a susceptible barley variety, um, we used uh, seed treatment followed by a foliar spray, and thinking about you know, net form and net blotch in this case, just looking at our crop variety choice for that paddock. So within this paddock, next year we could go back with same variety. That's exposing us to a lot of risk that we are going to have to use fungicides to effectively manage that. The better option, if we are going to go back with barley, is to avoid a highly susceptible variety. So move to a variety with some resistance. But an even better option is to rotate away from barley so that we're not that we're planting a different crop that's not going to expose to that net form and net botch risk. Now there will be scenarios, again, where we do need to go back with um, same variety for whatever reason, and it's going to be um, at a high risk of net form and net blotch. So if we are reliant on fungicides for our control, we also need to look at strategies that protect the fungicide. If we go back with the same group of chemistries, we're just exposing that population again to the, that same selection pressure, greatly increasing the chances of fungicide resistance developing. Yeah, we could mix it up and for our foliar spray, instead of using tebuconazole, um, using a, a mix of an SDHI and a prothiconazole. In this case, that's resulting in an SDHI being applied at planting and then again at um, during the season. So again, not a good strategy. We're going to be selecting for SDHI resistance in the pathogen population. A better option if we do have to be in that situation is and we don't want to keep using the same SDHI, using an SDHI every year if we're in this situation. So we reduce our reliance on that. And um, what we've done is come in with a triazole as the first spray and following up with a mixture of a strobe and a, tri a different triazole later in the season. So just sum up, I think in terms, this is all about providing effective disease management and the it's about starting with a solid foundation with variety selection. So where possible, select resistant or less avoiding the sucker varieties to reduce reliance on fungicides throughout the whole season. Then look at the other strategies that we can use on farm, such as crop rotation. So again, that paddock selection. Manage our inoculum, which is coming off the green bridge for some diseases or stubble management. In some cases, it'll be avoiding that early sowing in high risk situations. And then the last part of our disease management strategy is only use when necessary fungicides, rotate modes of action, use mixtures when available, stay within label rates. And this is the way we should be looking at it, that our 
fungus, our disease management strategy shouldn't be underpinned by fungicides. It's got to be underpinned by the other things. And then fungicides is what comes in at the end only when necessary. If we make them do all the work, you'll lose them. All right, I'll um, wrap it up there and I'll pass back to you, Kylie, to... Um... Pull it up, no worries, thanks, Grant. Um... Just in a minute, if it's not already there in your um, chat um, on the call, just we're just putting in a little two minute survey for the feedback on this webinar. We'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, and I'd really encourage you to please send through any questions through that Q&A function um, as we move forward. I'll let that percolate in your minds because um, I just wanted to cover again the APRON network is quite broad. There's a few friendly smiling faces there on there that you may certainly know. Um, so I'd encourage you to connect with anyone in the network um, to keep up to date on fungicide resistance developments and extension in Australia. Can I grab the next slide, Grant? Okay, that's questions. Next one then, I've already asked for questions. Acknowledgements, yep, to the um, to Andrew and Art. Um, so uh, I'll leave this up while we wait for some questions to come in. Just a reminder that we will be um, releasing a guide in the, our plan is to do that ahead of the next season. Um, there's workshops, info sessions and webinars coming up and you can access any of the webinars on the AFRIN website and you'll get a link to today's webinar at the end of it. Um, and we'll be using GRDC networks and anyone who's signed up to our mailing list to get information out to you. Um, and for those of you who are in Victoria, um, definitely get in touch with, with Grant. Um, and always start with your regional plant pathologist. Um, that's the best place to start because they'll be able to tell you if it is fungicide resistance that you're likely looking at um, and it keeps everyone in the loop. Um, so now to questions. Uh, we've just got one here from Frank, um, just asking if there is a model or an app for Septoria on the drawing board. Do you know anything about that at all, Grant? Yeah, I think uh, on the drawing board is probably correct. It is, it is one of the diseases that we've identified as a priority, but it's not something you will see in the short term. Yeah, no worries. So it's on, on the list. I know there's a lot of those um, decision support tools coming out and people are finding them really useful. So I can understand that. Um, I guess given that uh, we've gotten through the whole session, Grant, did you want to maybe just quickly cover off on what you think the top disease concerns are in your region uh, the, for this season and how growers can best manage them? Yeah, the one that's uh, creating a lot of interest at the moment is strike rust. And that's particularly because we are seeing strike rust across Victoria earlier than we have for a few years now. And the impact of strike rust is much higher the earlier that it comes in. So uh, we've been encouraging people to get out, have a look at their crops um, to see whether there's rust there uh, with a view to making a timely fungicide application. The, the thing that's uh, of significance is that we've got a new strain of stripe rust that has become dominant across uh, Southern Australia. And that one has some increased implications for uh, durum wheats. So if you've got, got durum varieties, you need to um, review the resistance ratings for those um, and keep an eye on durum crops and also varieties such as uh, Bennett and Trojan uh, are a lot more susceptible than what they used to be. If rust is appearing in crops now and um, you don't have adequate resistance in them, a timely fungicide is warranted. You will get um, definitely get a return from it based on how early the strike rust is present. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks for that, Grant. And we should also note that um, rust is one of the lower risk um, diseases or for fungicide resistance development um, globally, actually, which is really really good. But as Grant said in the webinar, consider what else is in that crop and other diseases there because you could just be selecting within that so it's still always good to have all of those other fungicide resistance strategies in place um, and good IDM or good integrated disease management 
should be good fungicide resistance management. Um, well, I don't think we've got any more questions. You've got a, you've got like maybe a, a minute to ask us if you've got any last minute ones, um, but otherwise we might all get an early mark. Um, is there any more further comments? I'll just check with Fran first. Um, do you have any further comments into the, I guess we're heading into the end of the growing season or mid midway to the end, yeah? Uh, for us, we're um, really in the business end of the season now. So we're, we're, we're later than most other parts of Australia. Okay. So yep. yeah, really disease management and monitoring is um, they're getting into the really critical time. And we've just had a period of um, you know, the last three weeks, most days we've had rain. So there's going to be a few surprises for people who get back on the paddocks and see how much it's changed in terms of growth and disease. Yeah. No worries, so keep your eyes peeled. Um, any final comments from you, Fran? Well, thank you, Kylie. Thank you, Grant. Um, that was a very nice presentation. Just, just probably a reminder uh, to anybody thinking on submitting samples for testing. Um, if the samples have to travel intrastate, that's quarantine material and it has to be submitted with the adequate input permit. So just request the input permit to be, to be sent to you uh, because we don't want to put, you know, um, any other regions at risks uh, because obviously imagine if you've got resistance in a particular paddock, say in South Australia and you're moving samples to Queensland, obviously, you know, there has to be uh, deal with uh, the adequate uh, safety measures. Thank you. Yep. No yeah, worries. Just, um, con you can contact my team and um, we've got the envelopes there to um, do that and we can um, help with that process. Yep. Yeah, so if you don't want to stress about the import permits, make it grants problem. So <laughs> that's easily enough done. Um, with all of that said and done, uh, thanks for attending today. Uh, at, we'll send you an email shortly with a link to that poll and to the um, webinar recording as well. So thanks everyone and uh, we'll see you, see you around the traps. Good luck with your seasons. Cheers. <laughs>